The Nintendo 64 is one of the strangest and most important consoles that Nintendo ever made. It was home to so many undeniable classics like Mario 64, GoldenEye, and Ocarina of Time, but it's also the home place of a ton of forgotten games. With Nintendo's insistence on selective porting, making virtual console inaccessible, doing time-limited releases like Super Mario 3D Collection, and most lately giving a subpar emulation with the NSO Plus expansion pack, it seems more than ever that a lot of these are going to be lost to time. Not that anyone like wants to play Body Harvest in 2021, but the mid 90s were home to ton of weird and cool games that I think anyone's lost in the mix. Now there's a bunch of things we could talk about, so I wanna focus on console exclusives in one game per genre if possible. So no, it's not gonna be a bunch of platformers considering every other game was a platformer back in this time. Sorry to all the Glover homies out there. I still love you though, all 14 of you. The Nintendo 64 was never my favorite console growing up, and that's probably because I have some deep-seated resentment as a lifetime Sega fan, but the games I did play on the thing have kind of stuck in my brain. I found out I was a hipster as a small child when I was asking for Bomberman 64 The Second Attack over like Banjo-Tooie or Paper Mario. Speaking of, we'll talk about Bomberman another time because that game's awesome, but we gotta make room for the more obscure stuff. So yo, it's Austin, and today we're gonna be diving into the world of forgotten Nintendo 64 games. Now, considering how much notoriety this console has, but how many games are actually on it, you could take like half the library and just throw it into this pile. It would be the whole video, but we don't have time for all of that, so I'm gonna focus on a few of the ones that I really wanna talk about. But before we get into that, I'm sure some of you noticed my new vision givers here, today's video was sponsored by GlassesUSA.com. Do you like having the ability to see, or more importantly, looking stylish while also being given the gift of vision? Well then, my friend, GlassesUSA.com is for you. They're an online retailer who cut out the middleman and offer prescription eyeglasses and sunglasses at affordable prices. There's over 6,000 different styles of frames to pick from, and everything goes up to 70% off for a complete set. These are Polo Ralph Lawrence that I actually put a blue lens filter on, so I can wear these while I'm gaming or editing for hours, which I did exactly for you guys today. I've been enjoying these, the Atoto Arolios as well. These kind of have that classic 80s style to them, but one of the ones I've really been enjoying are these, the Crystals, which kind of make me look like a mage or something. Like I'm gonna cast a spell. It's awesome. GlassesUSA.com has a new quiz tool on their website that you can utilize in order to find a good pair for yourself. I know there's a lot to pick from, but you can use the quiz to narrow it down and find something that fits your needs just right. The finesse here are a look that I've never really worn before, but I think they fit. And if you want to go a bit further, take the pair from your quiz and pop it into the virtual mirror to see how it and any pair on the website looks on any picture or selfie that you got laying around. There's a 14 day 100% money back guarantee, so you can try anything on the website without any risk. The holidays are here, so spread some cheer and give yourself or a loved one the gift of sight with GlassesUSA.com today. And you can do that by using one of the links in the description. Treat your face. Thanks to GlassesUSA.com for the sponsor today. Check them out. So back to gaming. Now, I want to start with the racing genre. There's a ton of racers on the Nintendo 64. You had like Mario Kart 64, F-Zero X, Diddy Kong Racing, 1080 Snowboarding, and that's just like a fraction of what the console had. You couldn't even keep the types of racing games consistent. We had kart racers like Mickey Speedway, future sci-fi racers like the two dope Extreme G games. There were realistic simulations, I'm using that word lightly, with like F1, over the top racers like Cruise in USA, California your speed or the rush games. The concept of racing wasn't held to any type of vehicle or standard in the genre, and over 60 racing games in total were released on this one console. And considering how many in 64 games there are, that's a lot. Am I a little upset we didn't get anywhere near as many RPGs? Absolutely, but more on that later. Because the racing spectrum is so large, I wanna talk about two little games here that are so different, they might as well be in a different genre. As much as I'd love to talk about Hydro Thunder again, it's like on every console. So first up, Snowboard Kids 2. Why 2? Well, because the original made its way to the PlayStation 1 in Japan, plus the sequel is dope. Let's talk about Rock Gene. This Japanese Osaka-based developer is one responsible for a ton of games you might have seen but never played. Mostly because only like half of their games made it out west, but thanks to Atlas, Snowboard Kids did. Now, Atlas in the 90s weren't very prominent in the States. In fact, you were more likely to not get whatever Atlas was releasing around this time, considering Mega 
Tommy Tensei and the whole Persona 2 situation. But at least we got rockin' cats. Based Atlas. Anyways, Snowboard Kids. This little franchise has peak late 90s energy. Massive hairdos, very cute concepts, and kart racing style power-ups that tread the Mario Kart side of the spectrum. Snowboarding itself gained major prominence around the late 90s when the Japanese Nagano Olympics introduced it as one of their main events, and you'd see a ton of games on it around this time. Heck, there were four different snowboarding games on the N64 alone, but only Snowboard Kids has stuck around in my brain. Maybe it's the fun character character designs, maybe it's the very cute 90s aesthetics with that very specific soundtrack and visual style. Maybe it's just the fact that they combined racing with tricks, power-ups, and over-the-top courses and shenanigans and threw them into this oven together. That combination rocked then, and it rocks now. There's different types of minigames and races you can do here, be they trick attack, a standard three-lap race, or like delivering the mail as you go down the mountain. Now you might be wondering how one does laps on a mountain, and that is of course with a ski lift. A lot of other snowboarding games around this time would have it be a single lap affair, but Snowboard Kids 2 has you competing to get onto the ski lift, which, I mean, can be kind of infuriating. Come on! This game is a definitive hidden gem on the Nintendo 64, and it's in a real soft spot in my heart, which would explain why I get real excited anytime someone announces a new snowboarding game. Uh, can we get a new SSX already though? The second racing game I want to talk about is definitely the weird one here. Yeah, like, Snowboard Kids wasn't weird enough, and I've gone back and played it, and I can confirm that it is A, still weird as hell, and B, a good time. This here is Iggy's Wrecking Balls, and also why I used to think Acclaim was cool. I don't think I've ever met another person who's played Iggy's. <laughs> Not that I blame them. The cover kind of treads on Nightmare Fuel. It's a weird iguana-looking ball, one with what looks like a small appendage functioning as a soul patch. Yeah, I don't know about that one, but I do think it's slightly better than the absolute hellscape known as the Japanese version. So this was developed by Iguana Entertainment, who we've been talking about a lot lately. They did the Turok games, they did Legends of Wrestling, they made Vex. Everyone remembers Vex. Whoa, what? Picture if you can the following. Racing game, platformer, bionic commando. Yeah, a bit hard, I know. But Iggy's Wrecking Balls has such a unique and weird experience that I couldn't help but love this thing as a kid. You pick one of the mini ball looking dudes and race quickly against AI to get through the platformer race courses, each of which has a different challenge. It's literally like mashing up Sonic the Hedgehog with Bionic Commando. You can go real fast like Sonic, but besides jumping, you have one ability and that's to grapple things with your, like a, like appendage and power ups, of course. What is this, not a racing game? So you can use this appendage to pull yourself upwards or swing around like in Bionic Commando. You can also use it to bully other racers, and you probably will. While by today's standards, this thing looks like a big janky mess without much direction in its design, it actually still feels pretty good to play. Going back to Snowboard Kids, it's got the typical kart racing rubber banding where AI will decide to end your life if it so chooses, but Iggy's has a lot less of that going on, and it's a lot more skill and movement based. It could take a second to get used to considering that it looks 3D but functions in a 2D manner, but the constant arrows on the map and simple platforming lend themselves to a good time. Sure, maybe the frame rate on actual hardware ain't great, especially with split screen, but if anyone ever whips out a copy of Iggy's, I'ma play it. Unfortunately, the rights to Iggy's Wrecking Balls got dissolved into another company when a claim went out of business, so both the concept and IP have essentially disappeared off the face of the planet. Would I play a modern remake or port of Iggy's, this cursed looking N64 game that reminds me of like the fake games in a 90s movie? Absolutely. Would anyone else? Probably not, but I will fight you about it. It's not a video of mine unless we go into licensed games, and the Nintendo 64 is kind of known for one of the highest selling of all time, you know, Goldeneye? Yeah, it even outsold Ocarina of Time, but they can't all be zingers, and there's bound to be a bunch that slipped through the cracks. Besides Bond, I think people probably remember the plethora of Star Wars games on the console, as well as the endless wrestling games. If you ever needed proof as to just how popular WCW was back in the day, look no further than the WCW NWO games both outselling the WWF stuff. That's nutty. A lot of the licensed games were like sports related, but there were also a bunch of tie-ins. For example, Mission Impossible, South Park, A Bug's Life, Ugh. Or how about Tom and Jerry and Fists of Furry? You know, the one with a pun for a name, a game that IGN lovingly called, quote, the next best fighter on the system after Super Smash Bros. 6.8, ouch. Fist of Furry is a Power Stone clone, for real. This was developed by Vis Entertainment Limited, the people who did Earthworm Jim 3D, which 
is immediately a little sus, but Fists of Fury is all right. I mean, look, it's a Tom and Jerry fighting game, one with extra characters who aren't Tom or Jerry, meaning you'll be engaging in combat that's sure to set off some red flags for PETA. It's that slapstick cartoony nonsense, and it translates relatively well into a Power Stone style fighting game. But the real question is like, who is this for? There's barely any features, the combat isn't engaging on any level beyond a 1-2-3 punch combo, and the AI can be mind-numbingly boring to play against. But for a licensed game in this era, it, it was all right. Now the Nintendo 64 had a ton of licensed games and a lot of them ended up being 3D platformers. Unfortunately, those games would end up being these six and sevens out of tens when they're going up against, you know, Mario 64, which is still my favorite 3D platformer to this day. So even though like Disney and Looney Tunes would have pretty solid platformers with Duck Dodgers and Quack Attack, they kind of just were in the middle still. I don't really know if it's fair to compare though, especially when you have a fun time with something like Rayman 2 or Space Station Silicon Valley, when you could be playing something like Blues Brothers 2000. I don't own many N64 games, but I do own this for some reason. I love the original Blues Brothers film, if only for its incredibly over-the-top car crash sequences. Between the two movies, 207 cars completely destroyed for the sake of a world record. Necessary? No. Amazing? Yes. The sequel, Blues Brothers 2000, was not received very well at all. In fact, it was a box office bomb. I never got around to seeing it, but I did happen to play a video game based on it, also called Blues Brothers 2000. One that was delayed so much, it came out two years after the film. This was developed by a group called Player One, who were only around for a brief amount of time, but they did give us Robotron 64, and that game was awesome. Blues Brothers isn't. So you start off with a crappy MIDI version of Aretha Franklin's Respect. Just a little bit. Just a little bit, that this bodes well. So this is about as standard of a 3D platformer as you can get. Collect items, do puzzles, jump on dudes' heads, go to the next level, except in this game, if you accidentally miss an item, you have to replay the entire stage in order to find it to progress. You ever think you beat a level in a game and it's like, <laughs> no, go back, idiot. But hey, be nice to the developer. They gotta pad it out considering the game's only four levels long and can be beaten in an hour and a half. Though it's closer to four considering how easy it is to die, get lost, or having to backtrack because you don't have all the collectibles. Love it. Your melee attack has to be one of the most pathetic looking and feeling I've ever seen in a video game. Now, people criticize Mario's punches for feeling a bit wonky at times, but I mean, at least he can hit anything. What's going on here? Blues Brothers 2000. Nope, next game. Going back to James Bond, I'm sure like literally everyone and their mother knows about Goldeneye, but what about James Bond's other Nintendo 64 game? The world is not enough. Garbage. No, that, that that's the band who sang the song. It's magnifique. It's not Cheryl Crow, but still. GoldenEye's younger brother seems to get glossed over quite a bit these days, which is wild considering both the movie and the game were pretty successful. I will never not see Pierce Brosnan as Bond, so this entire era of 007 will always hit that sweet spot of nostalgia, even if one of them is a... Uh, die another day. Thankfully, that didn't get a video game. The entire thing would be an ice level. The World Is Not Enough came out in 1999, quickly becoming the highest grossing bomb film of all time at that point, got itself a brand new video game that was by all means very highly anticipated, and then I feel like everyone promptly forgot about both of them. I guess it's probably because they both lacked the same oomph and attitude that Goldeneye had. Goldeneye had and started with the debut of a fresh new James Bond and a dude jumping off of a dam. A nine minute sequence turned into four classic and unforgettable levels. Yo, if we really think about it for a second, where else have you seen a dude drive off of a cliff on a motorcycle, board a plane in the middle of falling, and then prevent it from crashing? This scene is, this scene is perfect. Instead of this being a rareware Nintendo joint, The World Is Not Enough was developed by Eurocom and published by EA, and was proof that someone else could do the job. This game is solid, but it's pretty different from its predecessor. It leans more into stealth and focusing more on the spy aspect of Her Majesty's Secret Service, as opposed to the shooting bang boom seen all over Goldeneye. Yeah, sure, James Bond is still a crazy mass murderer, but this one has you solving more puzzles and attempting to sneak around and infiltrate. And if I know gamers, this is not the sequel they wanted. I do, however, think that World Is Not Enough is a pretty good licensed game, and one of Eurocom's best from that era. It's just unfortunate that they got thrown into the licensed gauntlet over the next few years, having their last game be that awful Call of Duty clone 007 Legends. But anyone who's played this or 
207 Nightfire knows what's up. Sure, you don't have long face Brosnan, but you did get a blue cartridge. Plus, you get to ski while shooting dudes at the same time, and who doesn't love that? What's your favorite genre of video game? Well, if you're a fan of the Nintendo 64, it's probably like a 3D platformer or a first person shooter. Mine was a Japanese RPG, and anyone who knows the Nintendo 64 knows that I was suffering. Following the Super Nintendo, the mainstream video game audience got really enamored with highbrow storytelling and long-winded narratives in the form of Japanese RPGs. However, due to what seems to be Nintendo's insistence on sticking with video game cartridges as opposed to brand new fancy discs, they lost high-profile developer Squaresoft, who would go on to absolutely destroy the PlayStation 1 with countless classic RPGs. CG cutscenes? We got them. I didn't have a PlayStation 1 back then. So, what were were we left with on the N64? Uh, not much. I'd venture to say that the thirst for RPGs was so high that we'd buy just about anything, which explains why anyone remembers Quest 64 at all. But there were a few notable ones. I think the standout is, of course, Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber. An extremely generic title, sure, but one that feels like a proper successor to the SNES classic, Ogre Battle. It's a tactical action RPG, lucky enough to get a few ports over time, but also one of the more expensive games on the console. So like every other Ogre game. Tactics Ogre, let us cling together, it's still the best one. Then there's Aiden Chronicles, a game way too ambitious for the Nintendo 64. A glitchy mess with a resolution option for some reason? Also, one of the last things released on the Nintendo 64, coming out in 2001, when Final Fantasy X was mere months from being willed into existence. It's a, a little dated. Oh yeah, I guess there's Paper Mario, that one game everyone loves that's gotten one really good sequel. I'm still a little sad that it wasn't Super Mario RPG 2, but it is what it is. Should have made it a disc console. Ah! The interesting game to me is one that came out in 1999. What happens when you combine Final Fantasy II, Metal Gear Solid, and wrestling? An eclectic hybrid of games for sure, but that's perfect for something called Hybrid Heaven. This is like peak 90s Konami. It opens with a half-naked dude with guile hair watching TV as we get a plot dump. One where he stands dripping in the shower in what has to be the most naked looking model on the entire console. So this hybrid heaven is a weird one. It's a narrative driven action RPG with a, well, hybrid combat system that uses active movement and turn based moves. You can punch, kick, do combo, and of course, do wrestling moves. If you've ever wanted to see what it would look like to do a running headlock to a random alien, this here's your game. The plot goes into aliens and aliens who experiment on humans to create synthetic clones and hybrids between the two species in order to attempt to replace the president. It's a total 90s plot. You spend a majority of the entire game in a huge underground base thing. Endless corridors of scientific looking sci-fi structures. There's not much variety here and it definitely comes off as Konami trying to one-up themselves with the recent success of Metal Gear Solid. I mean, it's not not every day you get voiced cutscenes with slight cinematography on the Nintendo 64 of all consoles. Hybrid Heaven is more bizarre than anything else. The combat is very slow paced and you'll essentially be watching the same mini cutscenes over and over as you punch, kick, and grapple enemies left and right. I feel like I wanna just try to break out of the holds, but it's a turn-based RPG, and so that means I basically just gotta watch as my character clearly assists the enemy aliens in performing brain busters directly to my own head. Hmm. Overall, Hybrid Heaven is a really neat concept and a cool idea, but it's very two-note. It's lacking variety. You crawl through dungeons, collecting keys and dodging traps while fighting the same dudes over and over. There's not much in the way of character development or story, which is what Metal Gear Solid was famous for, but you do get to grind your stats up Final Fantasy II style by, well, playing the game. Unfortunately, you can't just smack yourself to get stronger, but alas. I'd personally say that considering that this was one of the only RPGs on the entire console, coming out in the heyday of RPGs, that it created a lot of hype. But ultimately, fans of the genre, including myself, wouldn't get the same quality you'd see on the other side of the pond. I like the art, though. There's a lot of things that I want to talk about, but unfortunately, not everything has a lot of substance. Therefore, I'm going to tackle a bunch of games real quick right now in what I'm calling the Forgotten Nintendo 64 Games Power Minute asterisk. Might be longer than a minute. And I'm going to start with an import. Have y'all ever heard of Rakuga Kids? 
Sticking with Konami a bit longer, there was the Japanese and European only Rakuka Kids. The Nintendo 64 wasn't really known for fighting games. Yeah, you had Super Smash Bros, but that was a big evolution of the traditional 1v1 fighter. Now there were a few, you had like Fighter's Destiny, Mortal Kombat, Flying Dragon, and Deadly Arts. Oh, and a War Gods. Jesus Christ, but the good fighters around this time were more Capcom heavy. Rakuga Kids, roughly Doodle Kids, is a fighter about kids making their chalk drawings beat the living crap out of each other, and this game is great. I love the visual style here. Getting a 2D sprite based style was more uncommon on the Nintendo 64, and I feel like they made the hybrid of visuals look smooth as butter. It's definitely strange to have a six button fighter on this console, considering, you know, a lot of those inputs aren't C buttons, but they did the best they could with this cursed controller. Konami doesn't do many fighting games these days, but this one was pretty cool. And you know who's also cool? Uh, Duke Nukem. Okay, maybe not. But when I was 10 years old, Duke Nukem was the epitome of a cool guy. He had a deep voice, shot many guns, and got all the babes. I have distinct memories of being like six years old and playing Duke Nukem 3D with my next door neighbor who showed me that you could hit space bar on the club dancers. And I thought that was pretty cool. A lot of people forget about the Nintendo 64 exclusive Duke Nukem game, Zero Hour. This thing was made by Eurocom, who also did the Bond game we talked about earlier. And this is surprisingly good, especially for the source material. I mean, it's Duke Nukem, so it's a little trashy, but third person Duke Nukem. It has this weird plot where you're traveling through time and space in order to save the world from and murder your ancestors. Very cool. It's no Duke Nukem 3D, but I mean, what is? Tetrisphere. I loved this game. Now, I've always had this weird soft spot for puzzle games. Tetris is a no-brainer, but you put some P-Cross in front of me and I'll get distracted like throwing a rock in a stealth game. Must have been the wind. This thing was originally going to be on the Atari Jaguar, but ended up making its way to the N64, and I'm glad it did, because no one owned a Jaguar. It was essentially an attempt at making Tetris into a full 3D puzzle game where you use Tetrominos in order to break through a sphere to get to the center. The developer, H2O Entertainment, didn't make too many games and unfortunately disappeared after the previously mentioned Aiden Chronicles, but this simple concept was cool enough for Nintendo to pick up and publish, and also stay in my brain and heart forever. Who doesn't like Tetris? No one I trust. Now for the game that only I'm gonna have fond memories of, Battle Tanks. Almighty gamer god in heaven, Battle Tanks. Now, I'd never say that the 3DO company was known for quality. Anyone want a dozen army men games? Portal Runner? But they did develop the Battle Tanks duology on the Nintendo 64, and this is about as simple as you can get. You are a tank, or tanks, and you shoot things. Is it realistic? Nah. Can you miraculously regain your shape with a health power up? Sure. Do I care? No. As a kid, treading around and blowing up stuff left and right was all I needed, and I'd play this with friends for hours. The sequel, Global Assault, is more of the same, a fun vehicle combat game in an era where that was all the rage. Even in 2021, I'd play this some more. Heck, I'd play right now. Let's go. And lastly, we gotta run back to Konami for a second. Goemon's Great Adventure. I covered the original as one of the first videos on my channel, and that one's uh, a bit dated at this point, but I've always had a huge fondness for this series. How can you not when it's got musical numbers. What other Nintendo 64 games had musical numbers? They're also solid platformers. Mystical Ninja starring Goemon is a perfect example of a Zelda clone done right, even though technically it came before Ocarina. But the follow-up, Goemon's Great Adventure, was much more traditional and similar to the older 2D games. It's tough, it's unforgiving, it's weird as heck, and that is all Ganbare Goemon. You didn't see many 2D platformers beyond like Kirby 64, Yoshi Story, and Mischief Makers, which is an often forgotten and amazing treasure uh, that treasure made, but all four of those are great. And done. Power minute, three. Three minutes, it's fine, whatever. There's a lot of games that I wanna talk about more, like maybe I'll go more into Goemon, and of course, Bomberman the 64 second attack, but for now, I wanna talk about one more game. If you ask me, one of the most easily passed over and often forgotten 3D platformers on the entire Nintendo 64 was Rocket Robot on Wheels. I think that 3D platformers are synonymous with Nintendo, and it's all because of this little guy right here. Yeah. It's a me, 
a Mario. Oh, and uh, these ones too, I guess. Some are worth mentioning too. Everyone knows the Rareware series of platformers with Banjo and Conker, but there's also Chameleon Twist 1 and 2, Toy Story 2, Tonic Trouble, Glover. The list is nearly endless, but only one game on this console is developed by the same people who brought us Ghost of Tsushima, Infamous, and Sly Cooper. Back in 1999, the now highly regarded Sucker Punch would release their very first video game, Rocket Robot on Wheels, a rare red cartridge one that goes for $70 loose, a game with an extremely unique mechanic that has next to no violence at all. One that initially got declined by Nintendo multiple times as a publisher. A project that essentially started as a small indie team that got picked up by Ubisoft that included a name change from Sprocket to Rocket. Good old lawsuits. But most importantly, is pretty good. Rocket Robot on Wheels is a 3D platformer in the 90s, so you do know what to expect. Jumping, floating platforms, puzzles, and collectibles. You play as Rocket, a uh, unicycle robot thing created by one Dr. Gavin who also created a space theme park. Unfortunately for everyone involved, one of the two star attractions decides to go rogue and hijack the entire park for himself, Jojo the Raccoon. We're in Jojo's world now, and it's up to Rocket to save the day before the Doc gets home. So basically like cleaning up after your younger siblings so you don't get blamed. I got it, it's relatable. I will say the visual aesthetic of Rocket is a bit out there. This generation of games were known for very eccentric styles, but Whoopi the Walrus is absolutely terrifying and I would not go to this park. It's got the same scary energy towards a child that the mountain sculpture of Whizpig and Diddy Kong Racing has. No thanks. Thankfully though, this game is solid. The music's bumping and goes into all kinds kinds of styles. The platforming is solid and the main mechanic is neat. Rather than a punch, Rocket's main thing is a grav laser. He can pick up objects and move them, which makes sense considering he ain't got no arms. You'll recover tickets and tokens in order to unlock new worlds and ability upgrades, and each level also has a vehicle or two that you can pilot. Rocket can essentially jump into a vase on whatever object and operate it so you'll get little fun cars here and there, or maybe even a roller coaster or a flying carpet. You can also use the grav laser to latch onto swing hooks and you can really really see a lot of the mechanics that are like proto Sly Cooper things going on. Despite going very family friendly and looking like a kid's cartoon, a lot of the platforming challenges are difficult enough for an older and more experienced gamer to appreciate. Now I'm not gonna go out there and say something audacious like this is one of the best platformers on the Nintendo 64, but maybe it is though. They managed to find a lot of cool ways to utilize Rocket's grav laser from combat moves to random mini games. They gave enough ability upgrades to make you feel special. I always appreciate a double jump. Every level feels totally unique and mechanically different from the others. Like boom, suddenly you're in a level that you can only fly around in. Sure, thanks, I love flying. I know this one's hard to track down these days, but Rocket Robot on Wheels is one of those platformers that is definitely worth your time. Even if you'll never be able to unsee Whoopi's unyielding stare. As remains in your brain forever. And that's all for today. The Nintendo 64 has a lot of games, like I keep saying. There's so many forgotten games that we could easily talk about, but you know, another time. Let me know if there's something you think I should look at. I'm actually gonna be doing a lot more deep dives like my Dragon Ball Z Kakarot and Battle Wonder World videos going on in the future. So if there's something that you think would be perfect for me, let me know down in the comments and I'll probably eventually get around to it. I will say that I am long overdue to cover Bomberman 64, the second attack, as that is one of my favorite Nintendo 64 games, but I have a couple more things I wanna do first. It would help if I could capture footage of that game without it looking bad. Anyways, I've been Austin, and join me next time when we talk about the clones of a small furry animal and his friend. Thanks again to GlassesUSA.com for the sponsor. Make sure to click the links down in the description to check out my frames and get yourself a pair today. Thank you so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Blackfoot Ferret, Brandon Howell, Chris Shelton, Christopher Olivia, Darren Newton, DX Buster, David Molnar, GM Pinks, Irrational, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Jordy McCaffrey, Kevin Zanowski, Karen Arder, Nick Irving, P Funk, Randall Bentley, and Ryan Talbert. Thank you so much for your generous support. Hope you guys enjoyed watching the video. I've never really talked about the Nintendo 64 on this channel, so I thought, yeah, you know what? I wanna do that. I wanna do that right now. So I did. Bada bing gaba goo. There will be several more videos before the end of the year before a brief hiatus in January so be on the lookout for those there's a lot of fun stuff coming up and I pretty much just gave away what's coming up next at the end of this video so you know uh use deduction I'll catch you guys next week bye bye